All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. I'm very excited today to be joined by Dr. Lauren Tessier. Um, Dr. Tessier is a naturopathic doctor who practices in the U.S. of A. And um, Dr. Tessier, if you don't mind just telling us a bit about your background, um, uh, that would be great. Yeah, thank you for having me. What a what a name for a podcast, right? You're, you're going to be lofty goal. Happy. Yeah, have a have a lot to cover for sure. And and mold's definitely one of them. Um, so a little about myself, like you mentioned, I'm a naturopathic physician licensed by the state of Vermont here in the United States. I was uh, trained out at Bastyr University. And after graduating, I headed back east. I'm originally a New Englander, um, hung my shingle in Vermont. And there I was practicing um, primary care. That was that was the goal. And as I was kind of um, chugging along, started to see quite a few cases that were um, non-responsive to a lot of, you know, our our common things. The most common one was like the brain fog and fatigue, you know, so <laughs> right off the bat, you start thinking, oh, anemia, vitamin D, you know, macrocytic anemia, what else could be going on? And, you know, the easy stuff, easy stuff was non-responsive. And then once we dug a little deeper, we <clears throat> found out that um, the person had been um, maintaining a home office in a basement that had been flooded by a hurricane hurricane that came around in um, 2011. And a lot of people don't think about hurricanes in Vermont, um, but you know we have the big mountain ridges and it all has to go downhill somewhere. And um, in this case, it went into this particular town. And um, you know, it was really eye-opening, you know, because they don't cover it much in school. I think mm -hmm. any school education, they don't cover it much. Hopefully yeah. that's changed by now. Mm -hmm. But um, do, so, do you, and sorry, sorry to interrupt, but do you, do you know if it's changed at all with breast deer? Like, do they talk about mold illness at all? I, I don't know. I think probably the closest, I, our environmental medicine physician did do a little bit of lecturing about toxic mold, but it was probably like five minutes in a, a one day thing, you know? Um, That's but probably of course, not enough. No, probably not enough. I'm still still learning and still teaching, you know, uh, even to this day. Mm -hmm. um, there'll, there'll always be plenty of information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so with this particular client, that kind of got me going on. Okay, I'm going to start asking people about, you know, water damage in their home or work or whatever and what their exposures look like. And then it just, it just blossomed in front of me. And you're like, oh my gosh, there's so many people out there with this exposure and with these chronic issues. And so that really um, pushed me into training. And so I started off with chronic inflammatory response syndrome. At the time, it was one of the um, most, most common or most widely available or most known of mold illness kind of courses certification. Mm -hmm. So studied that, sat for that license or not license, that certification. Mm -hmm. Um and then hung my shingle for my mold practice. But then as time marched on, it was like, you know, there's there's really more than one way to treat someone. And not every single mold reaction, illness, what have you, is SIRS. It's just it's not. Mm -hmm. Um and with how different people are, you it's not a one size fits all. It'll be a one size fits all. It's great to do that when you're starting to learn um, and really starting to understand something to its core. But you know, in clinical practice, you need you need to have that flexibility. So, um, you know, I started digging deeper and started just educating myself even more, and that's more or less how I started to educate other people and started um, lecturing and doing all that kind of good stuff. And I became involved in ICI, the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. They're an educational uh, professional nonprofit that teaches physicians or brings a community of physicians together who do this on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, there with that organization, I started as a board member and kind of moved up through the ranks from secretary to vice president and now president. And it's been a really humbling experience it's been such a humbling experience and it's such a wonderful community to see so many physicians learning from one another in a really um, warm, kind way um, and just kind of bringing new ideas to the table. So that's kind of where I am now. I maintain my mold illness practice 
Um, I also do educational consulting for people. Um, and then I lecture and I, I do plan on staying with ICI for as long as possible. So that's kind of kind of where I am now. That's me in a nutshell. That's that's a good nutshell. That's a pretty full nut, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and ICI is just such an amazing or organization. Uh, I've never had the opportunity to date to go to one of the in-person conferences, but just from what I gather from the the online forum and the um, the recordings of other courses and, and whatnot, like, yeah, there's just so much integrity and uh, compassion and just innovation. It's just it's just awesome. So it's a yeah. great, great group to be the head of, I, I would say. Um, and oh, shoot, I was going to ask you something else and it escaped me. Um, Okay, it, I'm sure it'll come back to me. It'll come back. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. Um, so uh, I, I know that uh, at least the, I, I, I um, you're you're a bit synonymous with mold toxicity in my mind. Um, so may, maybe I, I didn't want to pigeonhole you with this interview. I have a bunch of questions mm -hmm. on a bunch of different topics. Of course, mold has its tendrils. Mold toxicity has its tendrils in so many different areas. But if it's right with you, I'm just going to start off with a question about uh, mitochondrial um, function. If that's okay. Sure. Absolutely. Um, um, so as, as anyone who follows me on social media knows, I have a bit of an obsession with mitochondrial health and function. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, I know that you wrote a great article in the NDNR um, looking at the impact of mycotoxins on fatigue and you talked about mitochondrial dysfunction in there. And so I'm just wondering if you could tell the listeners uh, what approach you take, uh, kind of a two-part question. So the first part is uh, what approach you take to assess mitochondrial function in patients that you're working with? Sure. So I... When I work with clients that, well, I have to reel it back a little bit. So um, the biggest mechanism of action that we think for um, mycotoxins is oxidation leading to lipid peroxidation. Lipid peroxidation is, um, you know, the, the damage of uh, fatty substances and fatty substances make up our membranes of all our cells, our membranes of our organelles, including the mitochondria. And so there's a good amount of research that shows that um, there's a lot of just outrageous mitochondrial dysfunction that happens um, with mycotoxin exposure. Uh, for me, I get, I do more of an approach of um, kind of the, the, what I need to fix when it comes from a mycotoxin standpoint, um, rather than how severe. I don't know if that if that makes sense. So, I don't do the um, AOH um, DG. I don't do that. I don't do the the uh, malonaldehyde. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are gasping <laughs> now at that point. But um, you know, for me, it's more. I want to get their toxic burden down and I want to do it in a way that's um, as affordable as possible mm -hmm. without kind of adding too much data onto it. And then based on clinical symptoms of what's happening of, you know, how well their um, detox pathways are moving forward, how well just the rest of their global metabolism seems to be moving forward, then I'll like tweak things there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that there's more, I'm sure I could learn a lot from you <laughs> when it comes from that topic. Um, but yeah, I try to kiss, right? I try to keep things as simple as possible when I work with mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for anyone who's not familiar with the KISS acronym, uh, keep it simple, stupid, I believe, or maybe that's- Keep it simple, it's, sweetheart. Is it sweetheart? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, it's, I'm it's, you're right. Canadian you're right. stereotypes here. That was so unfriendly of me. That's the only, oh, okay. I've, been, I've never heard the sweetheart. That's that's much nicer. I, yeah. I think that's just the mother in me. Where you're okay, like, oh, that, that must be it. <laughs> there, there was one lecture I went to once and the, the guy actually was like a weekend course and like the guy just, said kiss like on every slide pretty much and he just always said keep it simple stupid I think it's like a Pavlovian response for me now um so anyways um yeah keeping it simple for sure and, and like despite my questionably healthy or unhealthy obsession with mitochondria um, my favorite test is to like just ask the patient like are you tired and if they right. say yes you've got mitochondrial dysfunction that's the end right. of the story um right. so um so in terms of like say organic acid testing or like um some of the genetic tests that are out there or um, like genomic testing or something like do you look at any of those things with patients I, to assess their mitochondrial function you know i i will let those inform a case if they've been done by other physicians sure. so if someone's like oh i have an oat test from a month or two ago can <clears> i bring it in? i'm like sure mm -hmm. let's sit down let's look about this yeah. you know also like what supplements were you on when you were taking these you know these yeah. are a, a snapshot in time 
Um, but that's to say with every test, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the oat test, you know, I I don't use again as often as mm-hmm. maybe other physicians, but I will absolutely look at it. Um, and the the genetic component. Now this is gonna maybe rock some people's worlds. Um, bring but it up, bring it up. yeah, <laughs> when it comes to genetic stuff, I actually love looking at SNPs, um, especially for your phase one and phase twos. Um, because that's really what I'm focusing on, on kind of like draining, draining, draining the sink, draining the tub, you know, draining the bucket is mm-hmm. working on those detox phases. So um, I get really excited about what's happening with um, your, your CYP pathways, what's happening with um, your GST pathways, all of that kind of good stuff, your mm-hmm. UGT pathways, um, even more so especially more so than the genetics that come with the whole SERS picture of the HLA, DQB, DQR. I just never saw the clinical application in those. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it translate into my clients. And it was also like, well, if I can't change anything about these HLA genes, but I can induce or kind of slow down some of these phase one, phase twos, Mm -hmm. I'm going to get more bang for my buck and having someone order two, $300 tests or go to a consult with someone to get that data. Then if I'm going to order those and then scare someone into thinking that they're the dreaded gene for the rest of their life. So, Mm -hmm. um, definitely a nerd when it comes to the detox genetics, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) again, when you step back and you look at it, it's like green tea, caffeine, you know, all of your inducers are, and so it's, it really just comes back to like, okay, well, we're, we're doing a very similar approach for Mm -hmm. a lot of these different things. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, I consider it like a little bit of, um, navel gazing or shoe gazing where like you can, you can examine things and pick things over and over and over and have lots of fun. Cause I think that you have a, uh, a, um, data oriented mindset <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm guessing similar to myself and yeah, so for sure um it gets really fun to go through and dig down and then you know after you've done this 10 times 30 times hundreds of times you're like okay it's a very similar approach for a lot of what we're doing here it, it's so true yeah it's uh yeah I, I oftentimes will say to patients when they're making that decision like okay are we going to do testing or are we going to you know move ahead more clinically and it's like well of all the hundreds of reports I've seen, like, you know, these are the most common things that come up in analogous cases. And, you know, sometimes you get surprised, but um, right. yeah, but there's something to be said about clinical experience. It's, uh, it's valuable um, in many ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's always the clinical experience where you move through knowing these things and then you get, like you said, like you get that curveball, you get that surprise mm-hmm. every now and then. So, For yeah. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, I do have one other mitochondrial question there, but I do remember, I did remember what my other question was that I forgot earlier. Um, you just, you mentioned in, when you're um, uh, giving your uh, little mini bio there that you do educational consultation, I think mm-hmm. you said. Um, and so would you mind just elaborating on what you mean by that? Sure. So I don't know if this is the same um, thing in Canada, but in the United States for naturopathic physicians, we have different scopes of practice in different states. Mm -hmm. And so in the US, that's that's our biggest issue when people are going from state to state, even if it's a licensed state. So in the state of Vermont, we have huge prescriptive rights. Um, Maryland, you have licensure, but you need to be um, supervised under an MD. And so what ends up happening is, I think a lot of people um, tend to practice in a cavalier manner Mm -hmm. um here stateside but I like being very cautious Mm -hmm. so with the educational consults uh what it ends up being is I'm I'm not prescribing I'm not ordering tests I'm not providing super bills I'm not diagnosing instead I'm speaking globally about a case and kind of um putting together a a write-up for someone to bring with them to their physician to have Mm -hmm. these dialogues and one of the things that we do encourage people to kind of iron out beforehand is making sure that their physician is receptive Mm -hmm. to getting this feedback and hearing this education. So um, that's really what an educational wellness consult is. So I have those clients through Life After Mold. And then I have my testier medical, which is my actual patients who are coming in, having their butt in the seat. And we're doing all of, you know, the prescriptive, the ordering labs, all that kind of good stuff. Gotcha. Okay, great. 
Um, I was wondering if it might be something like that. And yeah. uh, at, at, at the end of my uh, my litany of questions here, I'm just going to ask you about some of those opportunities for folks to work with you. So uh, maybe we'll we'll circle back around to that at the end, if that's sure. all right. Um, but thanks for uh, uh, explaining that. Um, on the mitochondrial level, so you know you've got a patient and um, you've deduced that they have some mitochondrial dysfunction going on. Um, so of course you're working on addressing you know the root cause factors that might be leading to that mitochondrial dysfunction. In terms of actually supporting those wonderful little organelles themselves, though, to help you know breathe some life back into those uh, mitochondria, what kind of things do you work with to um, treat the dysfunctional mitochondria? Sure, and I again I go very simple on that because I tend to have a lot of people who have. Um, my biggest issue with clients is usually a mast cell activation thing that prevents mm -hmm. me from <laughs> putting stuff into them, as I'm mm -hmm. sure that you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. So, um, a lot of these, um, multi-ingredient products, they just, I, I can't, they can't touch people. I can't, mm -hmm. um, get them into people. And so, um, usually there's like an MCAS thing or that's mast cell activation. Sorry if people aren't familiar um, thing that we have to address first before we can do that. And even then I'm doing kind of step-by-step -step slow integration of some of this mitochondrial support and, you know, things as simple as how does a high, high fat diet look, you know, how do fat soluble antioxidants look, um, you know, carnitine's always a big one. CoQ10 is always a big one. Um, and, the, sorry, and sorry to interrupt, but it's like, are you um, doing like lab tests to assess those or it's more like those are definitely ones that are going to be part of your protocol if you can manage to get it into the patient. Those are ones that are going to be, I, I hate using the word protocol, but those are going to be the ones that I'm going the, to choose. The, the, the prescription. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Or, like I, yeah. no, I, I think it's, it's not so much the, yeah, I think it's the protocol. I, I worry about the cookie cutter concept, course, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are usually my, my safer ones to go mm -hmm. to before we start playing with some of the other things. Um, red light therapy is always mm. seems to be really well tolerated for my clients. Um, and then after that, then I start to get in some of the, the bees and trace minerals, um, following that, but I really want to set the foundation with what constitutes that mitochondria. And that's usually like fat and how we move fat around the cell. So mm -hmm. that's usually the, the foundational approach I'm taking from there. And, and so in terms of the fat, is that like, um, through mostly through dietary fat or essential fatty acids or phosphatidylcholine or what, uh, what yeah so phosphatidylcholine is always a cornerstone for me with folks and then um you know i hate saying the keto diet but because <laughs> it, it has its pros and cons and different mm -hmm. constitutions don't work as well with it mm -hmm. um but even just asking someone to integrate more high quality grass-fed saturated fats into their diet um, is usually what that looks like. So I'm um, doing it dietarily and with phospholipids first. I find that phospholipids are really well tolerated. Mm -hmm. um, I don't worry too much about the, um, see now my brain is going to blink, um, the uh, the cardiac uh, dangers with uh, poor uh, phospholipids. I don't see that toxicity all that often. Mm -hmm. I think it's the what the TMNs the pregnancy right now <laughs> and sure. pulling that answer out of my brain. Um, so I find that the phospholipids are really generally tolerated as well as high fat diets. And if that's not um, making that foundational step, that foundational padding, there's usually one step back where it's kind of like, okay, what's happening with the liver? Do we need to be supporting with Tudka before we move into it? So, you know, it's always this kind of like middle ground of, supporting the fat, but then what are all the layers that either come before it, before we can get deeper into the mitochondria? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and just on that uh, um, kind of phospholipid note, because um, I've um, had, I've taken several runs at using phospholipids in my protocols, and um, it's been relatively rare that when I've prescribed phospholipids to patients, that there's been this like really obvious clinical change from that itself. It's not like, oh, I went on also total choline, like my energy so much better, my brain so much clearer. Um, and I'm just wondering if either I'm just having bad luck, the water's different here in Canada, or I'm wondering if the fossil lipids are more of like, uh, just sort of like you get those in place and then you find, oh, when those are in place, then patients tend to respond better to future therapies or yeah. um, they tolerate things better. 
Yeah, definitely the latter. I I don't okay. really see other than the phosphatidylserine sometimes helping mm-hmm. with people's sleep. Sure. Yeah. At night, in the, mm-hmm. like the rare five percent of cases, mm-hmm. um, I don't see big drastic change. I've had a couple of okay. clients say like they inflame it from an inflammatory perspective. They feel cooler, which mm-hmm. I think is interesting. I get mm-hmm. a little bit of a huh. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, it lays the foundation to decrease some of the reactivity, especially what I find to be the binder reactivity um later on so yeah okay that's great so you're not um, doing anything wrong <laughs> good good to hear um, um and so so if i was to simplify or like um uh condense what you just said down into like a, a single bullet point um would it be like it helps to improve tolerability of future treatments or does it make future treatments more effective not that those are mutually exclusive i would say a little bit of both but the toleration Mm-hmm. seems to be the the stronger point there yeah okay. and where i'm going to ask you about um mcas and histamine next so you already segued yeah. into that earlier which is great um do you think that uh or think or know whether or not phospholipids are helpful with mast cell stabilization at all you know i i i think of everything as six degrees of separation in the body i don't know if you've ever played that board game six yeah, degrees yeah. of kevin yeah, yeah. anyway mm-hmm dating myself on that one but um I it's one of those like yes and you know I'm mm-hmm. sure that we could find some type of connection between phospholipids and between helping to support um the the membrane the uh, membrane stabilization or um you know the something about like the the lysosome stabilization so it's not dehisting as much or like I'm sure we could find a connection. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I I don't consider phospholipids to be part of my my MCAS treatment. Maybe the mm-hmm. foundation to get it to be tolerated. Um, but I don't I don't consider it a particular modality for, for MCAS. Mm-hmm. And other physicians might be screaming right now, but you know, so that's that's my approach for it. Okay. If, yeah. if anybody is screaming, please, please email <laughs> me or contact us and let us know because it'd be nice to know if somebody. Yeah, is I, like, um, I'd love okay. to see the PubMed ID on that and like sure. the study on that. That would be amazing. Yeah. Please edify me. I'd love it. For sure. Yeah, so I never heard. Yeah, we always want to learn more. Obviously, there's always so much to learn. Well, it's actually kind of a, a good segue into the next question because one of the things that I lament in practice is that um, like I feel like, for example, in, in the realm of treating chronic infections, uh, where I mostly use herbs in that regard, there's like so many different herbs you can choose. And I'm like, oh, patient, you can't tolerate this or that didn't work for you. Let's, you know, there's like dozens of, maybe not, there's, yeah, probably dozens of herbs that we could pick from an antimicrobial perspective. You yeah. phase into the realm of mast cell activation syndrome or histamine intolerance. It's like, well, uh, well, let's say, let's just say MCAS um, for, for this purpose. Um, there's not really that, in my, to my knowledge anyways, there's not really that litany of like multiple, multiple products to choose from. I mean, um, you've got your certain categories of pharmaceuticals. Um, mm-hmm. You've got, you know, some natural products. Um, every time there's one of the many reasons I love the ICI conferences that there's always a focus on MCAS. And I'm always like listening with bated breath, like is somebody going to talk about a new intervention? Right. Um, <laughs> and, and like, there's just, it's so rare that something new comes out um and so i'm uh, so anyways with, with that preamble out of the way um yeah. could you share uh, what some of your go-to pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceuticals are for mitigating histamine symptoms yeah absolutely so um with mast cell approaches first thing i'll say surprise surprise i don't test i don't bother testing for mast cell mm-hmm. i get into a dialogue with my clients where we're treating presumptively here um, because a presumptive treatment can also um, kind of be uh, point towards a diagnosis a little bit. And we're using very low risk interventions. So mm-hmm. once people are kind of, you know, um, consented and aware of that, properly mm-hmm. informed, mm-hmm. Um, we usually move forward because the the testing, as you know, it's like you need a baseline. And then when someone's in their flare feeling the worst of their worst, mm-hmm. <laughs> they need to schlep to a hospital that actually is like it's no, I'm not, not going to do that. Too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I do a lot of presumptive treatment and I start with my H1 and H2 blockers, mm-hmm. you know, um, and the reason why um, is I find that herbs will always, herbs can get you in trouble. A lot of people freely use herbs without um, 
thinking about the risks they think mm-hmm. oh they're natural so they must be great and you and I both know like you can really upset someone's system with herbs and so mm-hmm. um I think that there is a time and place for pharmaceuticals and direct targeted pharmaceutical action um in this case the h1s and h2s um I tend to be a big fan of um Benadryl, so the first generation H1s, unless someone tends to have an antithetical reaction where they get stimmy with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'd consider going to the ones that don't cross the blood brain barrier as much. Um, H2s, Pepsid AC, a lot of people are really nervous about that one just because they usually come to you and they say, I've worked on my gut for so long, like mm-hmm. I don't want to throw it off. Mm-hmm. And I always try to reassure people that we're not necessarily blocking acid. You know, I'm sure there's a couple of degrees of separation between H2 and blocking acid, but um, it's it's not a um, omeprazole or anything like that where mm-hmm. we're working more the histamine target. So H1, H2s, and I like those because they're over the counter. Mm-hmm. They have low financial risk. They have just so much going on with them. So I try to go as easy peasy as that. After that, you know, we'll go into chromalin, we'll go into catodifin. Those are kind of my second levels just because chromalin's a pain in the butt and catodifin has to be compounded, which mm-hmm. can get expensive. Um, but the nice part about chromalin too is you can um, directly target different tissues. So if someone is having more of a mast cell GI issue, you can do the liquid. Or if they're tending to have more of a nasal respiratory, you can do you know, the nasal sprays or even the eye drops. So I think that there's a a benefit to Kremlin on that front. And then moving on from there, um, you know, uh, there can be an amalgamation of all of those H1, H2s and um, stabilizers. And then once I kind of get someone balanced um, and we maintain them for a while and we do our detox work, then we'll start to consider um, bringing on a natural substance so we can kind of, um, put something more natural on and take off something more synthetic for mm-hmm. people. Um, but usually once we get the mast cells kind of calm down, um, then I start, once we get the mast cells calm down, then we can move into detox. And then after that is when we start to work more the immunomodulation of trying to get things balance back in and then we take off the mast cell stuff mm-hmm. um from the herbal perspective gosh i people love quercetin and i see like a 20 percent effectiveness and like i'll you know people can get up to like 3600 milligrams a day like a, a lot. I, right it's tons and it's so expensive mm-hmm. and um I, it's, it's a mixed bag. And I'm always surprised when someone says, oh yeah, I take course and I do great. Okay, mm-hmm. perfect. Like, let's not change that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there's just, there's so many different things that people say from an herbal perspective can help mast cells. And I see it and I see some benefit and, um, you know, heaven forgive me, but I feel like a lot of times, um, it's people who might be a little bit newer to botanical medicine Hmm. who um, engage it in a way that like it has all the answers Hmm. um, because it doesn't like I, you know, quercetin is not always going to work in someone. Um, ECGC is not always going to work for some, or the, the the green tea extract, Um, you know, black seed is not always going to work for people. So I don't know. I have a little bit of mixed emotions there. And then on top of it, you'll have patients who'll come in he'll say that has the oxalates in it. Like Mm. I can't do that. And Mm -hmm. so um, you kind of, I feel like there's a little bit more safety in the pharmaceutical approaches, but if someone comes in and they say, you know, I don't want to do the farms, I'm always going to work with them and try to to do the more natural approaches. But um, if we're going from brass tacks where, you know, no one has a desire to move one way or the other, I'm usually going to start with the over-the-counter pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, me too, um, for all the reasons you said. Um, I, I think my success rate with quercetin is a little bit higher, but I also find that if a patient's like in just full-blown MCAS mode out of the gate, I don't even bring up the quercetin as a rule unless pharmaceuticals right. are off the table because it's just so rare that it helps. But once things start to settle down enough, it sometimes works better um, as they're you know settling a bit, as you were alluding to there, I think. 
Um, I have about 10 more questions that just generated sure. from everything that you just said. So uh, we're, we're never going to get through this list, but that's okay. So it's, all, it's all been riveting uh, for me so far. So I have one, one happy camper in the audience anyway, so far. Um, so a couple, just a couple of maybe more rapid fire questions here. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, so if you have a patient who's um, say already on like H1 blockers, so, um, yeah. and I know the names of the drugs are a little bit different um, across our borders, but like say that would be like Zyrtec or Reactin or, Arius or different ones that are out there. Um, mm -hmm. So you have your H1 blocker. Um, if you have a patient who's already on an H1 blocker and then an H2 blocker is added in on top of that, I'm just wondering what percentage of the time do you find that that H2 blocker brings additional benefit? Is it like 90% of the time, 10% of the time, 50% of the time, like just ballpark? Um, how, how often is it of additional benefit? I feel like the H1 is a, is a 40 to 50% and then bringing on the H2 additionally for people. Um, I'm going to kind of go from an o overall can like bump up the benefit to maybe like those combined to maybe, um, 60% of cases. So it's not, it's not a huge one mm -hmm. okay. by any means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually if we're not finding the benefit in H1, mm -hmm. I, I have a little bit more shadowing in my gut that we're probably going to need an H2 and chromalin mm -hmm. <laughs> to move forward. Right. Okay. And um, how often, like when patients do go on those H2 blockers, um, do you find that they have digestive consequences? Really very rare. rarely, yeah. very yeah. rarely. That's great. It's a hard thing to convince people though, because I mean, gut health yeah. is so in their face all the time. And it's when someone's committed and dedicated, they have given up so much to work mm -hmm. on their gut health. So I, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, yeah. And then in terms of the um, dosing for H1 blockers, and I should have said this at the start of our chat, but uh, nothing that we're talking about today should be construed as medical advice. Um, this is all for informational purposes only. Talk to your personal health care provider uh, before making any medical decisions for yourself. Um, and I'm not going to ask about specifics of dosing. I, I might email you later about this, but um, I'm just curious. Um, like typically um, the dosing that you find for folks, it, it, how often would you need to go like markedly above what's on, you know, the box, um, like for the OTC stuff? Like I have always, I have people start with half tabs. Sure. Because yeah, I just, yeah. I don't always know what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, like even smart. lower than the box. Um, I, I tell people that if you're, if you're getting up to 50 and you're not seeing a shift in a change, um, whether it's with reactivity or the, the, um, anxiety that comes with, you know, the, the stimulating histamine, mm -hmm. like it's probably not our intervention. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want people up on 75 milligrams of Benadryl. Mm -hmm. Um, so I tried to go maybe two times what that, um, suggested limit is mm -hmm. maybe more people are, you know, more cavalier when it comes to that kind of stuff, but, mm -hmm. um, I still want to push it. Mm -hmm. And like, how often would folks need to go like kind of above that typical, like OT, OTC dose, like that's on the box so in your experience? Yeah. I feel like, um, quite a few, I don't want to say like 50, 60% go, okay. go up to the 50 milligrams and, and like they'll notice like about they'll notice that there's additional benefit if they go higher um no not necessarily we kind of get them up to the 50 and mm -hmm. then we stop there and if they don't have benefit then we bring on the h2 and add it on as another layer yep okay yeah. um and then also um just in terms of like you know uh just for folks listening, so like first generation antihistamines like Benadryl, they cross the blood brain barrier. Um, second generations, one, generation ones don't, uh, which is why they're generally marketed as being non drowsy, although more accurately should be called less drowsy because some people do get drowsy <laughs> from them. Um, and so I know you said, I, I believe you said earlier that you generally prefer the H1 block or the uh, first generation ones that cross the blood brain barrier. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm just wondering um, uh, how, I guess, kind of two questions there. So one is, um, do you, uh, uh, how do you conceptualize like why that's more helpful for folks than like a, a second generation one? Yeah. Um, so a lot of my clients are coming in with, um, severe, uh, neurocognitive symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that, um, a lot of anxiety or overstimulation or, mm -hmm. um, so I like to see if we can get some reduction and anxiety or, you know, whatever that, uh, simulatory picture is as they move through their day. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So that's why I like the H1. So even that's, this is a, actually a good segue. Um, even if we don't use Benadryl, sometimes we'll use the hydroxyzine, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is a little bit more heavy duty and it also requires a prescription. So there's a little bit more complication and finances in that. Um, but I, I find that anxiety can be a huge component of mold illness and, mm -hmm. You know, is it the histamine? Is it the fact that they're not sleeping? Is it the social stress on the relationship? So anything that I can kind of do to get a little bit of help on that front and a little bit of an improvement in sleep, I'm mm -hmm. going to go after. And so I try to um, hedge that off at the past by having people typically dose at night with mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and then uh, one last question here, uh, kind of on this topic. Um, so you mentioned, and uh, paraphrasing a bit, but uh, says something to the effect of, you know, we'll bring in the pharmaceuticals, settle things down, maybe phase them onto some non-pharmaceutical options. Um, you know, those things are more settled. And then um, you, I believe you said that then you'd start working more on immunomodulation. And I'm just yeah. wondering what kind of immunomodulators or what kind of approach you use to immunomodulate. <laughs> All of it. All of it. Lovely. Um, I've been playing around recently with um, the Cyrex lymphocyte map test. Um, mm. I don't know if you can get it in Canada it might be only Not stateside sure. but the beautiful part about it is it goes through all of your different subsets um so it goes through your T cell subsets your B cells your different NK cells they put them in ratios to one another they put them in percentages to one another so it's like um a CBC on steroids like <laughs> it tells you so much data mm -hmm. and it also lets you know um, if someone's leaning a little bit more TH1 or TH2 or TH17, I'm going to put a pin in that because the data there is a little screwy too, because we're finding out more and more that my viral response might be more TH1, where your viral response might be more TH2. Mm -hmm. So those typical patterns that we've come to know and love might actually be built on um, shaky ground, which elucidates some clinical confusion. For sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, it's almost okay. like the body is complicated or something. <laughs> I it's know. Go so ahead. crazy. Yeah. Surprise. Um, so based off of that, um, I've been wanting to, that, that has been helpful to clear up some things. So if I see that, you know, someone's maybe leaning a little bit more to pH 17 and their NK cells are spiked and they're also someone with a mast cell picture, I'm going to start scratching my head about what's happening with a chronic underlying infection in the body. Um, and so it, I'm excited about this test. I'm still learning the ropes of it and kind of going through that process with it. But, um, I feel like it can hold a lot of utility. And then based off of that, then you can start to play with what can I do to support these levels? Um, or not even necessarily what can I do to drive up a level or drive down a level? What can I do to address the root cause of mm -hmm. the dysfunction of this level? Mm -hmm. um, and so immune modulators, I mean, one of my all-time favorites is melatonin. Mm -hmm. um, and melatonin has gotten a really bad rap over the past. Yeah, well, really? because, yeah, um, it's it's because over-the-counter medications, over-the-counter supplements um, have been tested and like three milligram melatonin will have 30 milligram melatonin in it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so a lot of these um, news companies have been running with headlines of, you'll overdose on melatonin. Well, mm -hmm. research shows that you can take up to 300 milligrams orally without negative impact. Um, and they're just using the word overdose as in literal to over the dose that's on the bottle. Uh -huh. um, they, yeah. So they don't cite any negative reactions, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people just read that headline. They go, Oh, melatonin overdose. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, mm -hmm. melatonin is great on so many levels. Um, and so I tend to use that a good amount for immune system, um, regulation of your T regs, which are the, I know you know this, but um, your T regs are your T helper cells of your white cells that help keep all the other T cells in balance. So it keeps your T, T helper ones, T helper twos, T helper 17. So they're kind of like the, um, the mediators of the immune system. So um, I mean, melatonin is 
great for that. Um, you know, artemisinin is a is another one that's really wonderful for some of this immune system dysfunction. Um, and then you start to look a little closer and you go, oh, a lot of the things that help with mast cell activation syndrome are also a lot of the wonderful things that support immune system dysregulation. So I, I find that really trying to find the underlying cause of the dysregulation that's leading to the MCAS mm -hmm. and then addressing it rather than just forcing cells to go up or down um, is usually my my approach. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. And, and I mean, with the melatonin, and I'm a huge fan of melatonin, uh, not the least of, uh, uh, one of the many reasons being uh, it's crucial for mitochondrial function as well. Yeah. Um, and and I, I don't know if you heard to the grapevine or not, but like melatonin has like been present like since we were all just like primordial goo. It's like oh, been wow. like unchanged for like trillions of years in evolution. I think like every living organism, if I remember, has melatonin in it. Oh. Uh, it just, yeah, it, it's fascinating. So anyways, um, with melatonin, um, aside from folks, you know, regularly having better sleep when they go on it, uh, I'm just wondering if aside from seeing lab uh, results normalizing or whatnot, um, are there particular clinical benefits that you see when someone starts on melatonin besides maybe sleep um, improvement if they're having sleep issues? Yeah, so there is a, there's a few different things there. I don't, I don't find that usually above 10 milligrams sleep changes. You know, I tell people when um, and I, I put people on higher doses, maybe not as high as some of our, um, some of our, uh, peers, um, but people hear the dose that I, I would like them to get to and mm -hmm. they go, but I, I, I don't have an issue sleeping. I go, mm -hmm. well, that's not what we're going after. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the absolute systemic, um, antioxidant potential of melatonin mm -hmm. is one of the things we go after, um, the sleep sure as a secondary, <laughs> But the way I picture it is um, as a huge nervous system antioxidant um, and really helps to bring the aspects of the nervous system into alignment. You know, we see big enhancements in sports performance. And what is that? That is brain, hand, foot, eye coordination. Mm -hmm. And with um, a lot of these mold folks, you have this decrease in the dialogue between those systems. And so um, using it as a nervous system antioxidant is probably my biggest rationale. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the other things that I really love kind of wrapping my head around, and this is a, a correlation, it's not a causation, right? We don't know what's the chicken and what's the egg in this one, but when people are melatonin deficient, they engage in a reflex that, I, I forgot the name of it, that... Um, initiates a clenching of the jaw, mm -hmm. which increases your interthecal pressure mm -hmm. in your cranium, which kind of puts the brain under increased strain and all the fluid there to try to push things down and out. <clears throat> that's the whole idea. So um, you'll see that's supposedly that's why, oh, people who have parasites, they grind their jaw. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, mm -hmm. let's reel this back a little and say that uh -huh. maybe people who have a increased need for antioxidant potential might be putting their brain under higher pressure in a way to try to move the lymphatics. And so <clears throat> I bet to people where I'm using melatonin as a way to mop up oxidation in the brain. But, you know, if we're going to use that um, metaphor of that jaw clenching, I'm essentially using it to wring out the sponge that is the brain and the nervous system to try to get that draining a bit more. Um, and the, the amazing part about melatonin is when I get people up to, you know, not outrageous doses, but higher doses, we start to see a post-nasal drip in the morning. Hmm. And it's really, it, it makes me really excited to hear because when I first had people starting to report about this post-nasal drip, it was right around the time um, that people that they had discovered or reported the glymphatics and the draining mm -hmm. into the lymph chain in the roof of the mouth, then going posterior down the throat. So, um, for me, that clinical connection really made sense. So, um, that's really what I'm using it for is to just try to open up the flow mm -hmm. in the cranial vault. That's really, um, and then everything else is a great secondary benefit, you know, and who knows, I, me using that that way 
might not even be the primary benefit. I might be completely blind to something else it might be doing in the body. And I'm just, you know, getting lucky on that mm-hmm. front, you know, just like anything in medicine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what they'll know in 50 years from now, you know, we'll be looking like primitive humans right. unto them. But yeah, but it, yeah, it's working. That's the most important thing, helping people to get better. But right. that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's such a fascinating compound uh, melatonin. Um, I should probably ask you a couple of questions about mold um, because otherwise people are going to, there's going to be an uproar. It's like, what, how can this, you know, how can you not talk to Dr. Tessier about mold? Um, so just ask you a, a couple of questions. I know we're, we're uh, getting a little bit short on time. Um, so I'm wondering uh, what percentage, of, <clears throat> excuse me, what percentage of the time do you find it to be imperative to treat the sinuses in patients with mold illness? Ooh, that's a good question. And it's also dependent on what you're going after and whose um, clinical logic you're following. Well, let's, let's um, use your, let's use your clinical my logic. Use, my clinical logic. Um, I would say sinuses like 30% of the time. Hmm. Sinuses okay. don't come on every single time. Um, and when they come on, they come on or they don't, um, they don't get addressed every single time. And when they do get addressed, they get addressed in different means. Um, meaning that do we just need to rinse your sinuses daily at the end of the day um, to pull off the allergenic mold fragments that are annoying the sinuses? Are we trying to clear out a histaminergic response? Um, <clears throat> are we addressing the sinuses with an antifungal? Cause we're worried about a fungal colonization being, um, a possible root cause of the problems or you know are we are we dealing with the whole um bacterial component the marcons picture um and i would say out of those three the first two would be my highest my, my two most important pressing reasons to treat the sinuses mm-hmm. um i don't do a lot of marcon stuff mm-hmm. anymore um there have been years where I've chased it and chased it and chased it without any benefit. Um, and there have been years where I've chased it without, with the first one, without any clinical benefit, the second one, without any um, ability to clear it. And then there are other times where we've cleared it and people seem to get re-inoculated, but the symptoms don't come back. And so it's, it really varies widely when it comes to that Marcon's picture. And, you know, I'm not gonna put people in a holding pattern based on a protocol where you have to clear Marcon's before you get to the next step. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, I would have patients who are still on that step, Mm -hmm. you know, five, six, seven years later. So um, my most important things are sinuses are either flushing, just get the mold fragments out Mm -hmm. or um, doing an antifungal if needed. Um, if we're worried about something kicking around there and the antifungal thing, I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing that I've had, um, clients where they've had severe, um, left-sided neck shoulder pain going from jaw down to shoulder. And we did a, um, nasal ketoconazole. And I mean, this pain had been around for like 10, 15 years, but it was nothing that really ever really manifested Mm -hmm. too much in the sinus and the face. And after like two days of a nasal antifungal, that cleared up. And you're like, okay, this is pretty amazing. Really interesting. Yeah. So, um, and I always try to be careful with antifungals. Um, th- there is a higher risk of resistance with antifungals just because of the minimal amount of drugs that we have. So mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of risk reduction that has to happen when people are using antifungals for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, just to check in, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Yeah, we can, that, we can go for better? a bit longer for sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. I just want to time manage here. Got a couple more things I definitely yeah, want to yeah, cover yeah. with you. Um, so n- another uh, question on the mold front. Um, so, uh, just in terms of binders. So, um, to my understanding, uh, you know, primarily from, uh, uh, Neil Nathan's, you know, book toxic and lectures he's given and whatnot, um, and, uh, and others as well. But my understanding is that there are some, um, I, I believe in vitro studies, please correct me if there are, are studies beyond that that you're aware of, um, that have basically um, demonstrated that or, or given evidence, evidence to believe that specific binders can be 
uh, better at binding certain mycotoxins than others. Um, and so I'm just wondering in your clinical experience, um, have you found that say patients come in and maybe they tested as having like elevated mm -hmm. gliotoxin, you know, they were on activated charcoal, but you know, they switched over to something like bentonite clay, which to my understanding is, you know, supposed to be a better binder for gliotoxin and like it, it made a significant difference. So have you found like matching the binder to the mycotoxin has been clinically important? Uh, if you can kind of speak to that topic a bit, please. Yeah, I would love to. Um, so that for me goes back to um, the idea of doing doing your oat test and seeing what specific subset thing is out of whack and matching it to this and matching it to that. And you can navel gaze and circle the drain for as long as you want on these things. Like you can make... Um, and forgive me for this loose language, you can make a protocol as sexy as you want, where you're like, I'm crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And, mm. and I, I was doing that for a while. I absolutely was, um, where, you know, I'd, I'd cycle people through <laughs> no longer well call. That's my huge PSA. Um, but I'd cycle through people through, you know, colocevalem, which at the time was like 900 a month before it was on generic. Wow. And then, you know, I'd say, okay, we're getting a little bit of traction there. This one's still spiked. Like, let's hop over to charcoal and then let's hop over to clay. And then I saw huge variances in the way people were tolerating different binders. And so clay gets scratched off my list. And I'll come back to that in a second. But clay gets scratched off my list because I was just worried about heavy metal issues mm -hmm. for people. Um, and so things started narrowing down. I was never a huge person on chlorophyll. I was never a huge person on, uh, fulvic and humic acids. IgG has a potential pin in it. It can be helpful. Um, but depending on people's immune system reactivity, it might not be modified citrus pectin. Sure. That's great, but it's really expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, and so after all this time, I've kind of just narrowed down to charcoal and well call. Um, and so a lot of people might be, um, you know, grasping at their pearls, clutching their pearls over that. But, you know, in, in these studies, if we, they, what they're doing here is uh, there might be a couple of studies that compare the connection, the efficacy of charcoal to clay but what they're doing is they're typically dumping this into a ton of food that they know have X amount of gliotoxins mm. and they have the control substance, eat the food untreated. And then they have the other pigs, cows, what have you eat the food that has the good amount of clay in it. And they see what the, the differences are maybe in the pathologies that pop up or maybe in the um, serum levels that pop up for the mycotoxins. And what I, I just kind of hit a point where if it's been studied, then the connection is being made. But there are some instances where clay was the only one that was studied for this mycotoxin and charcoal was never studied for that mycotoxin. And so what was happening was um, clay equals aflatoxin, aflatoxin only kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it was this connection in my eyes and I might have not dived deep enough, um, but what I was seeing happening was um, the lack of study proven um, correlation was a lack of evidence. Mm -hmm. And I just, I didn't see that happening. I very rarely now have to take people off of charcoal and move them on to something else when it comes to a binder. Um, unless they're having a poor toleration issue that's either constipation or diarrhea or liver quadrant pain. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, charcoal usually does it all for people for me. And if they're, and it's, that's really based off, it's a mechanism of action. Like it does the damn thing. Like it has increased surface area. <laughs> it's a binder. Mm -hmm, it is. We use it, we use it for, um, amanita poisoning in the ER we use it for Tylenol poisoning like it's gonna get the thing out mm -hmm. and so 
Um, for me, I stand by its mechanism of, of action. I stand by its price point and I stand by its pretty decent toleration. And again, like you can, you can match people to all these different things, but I've seen, I won't name companies, but there are a lot of these like sexy products that have every binder in it. And it just, mm -hmm. and it's a great idea, but people will come to me and be like, I tried that binder and I can't do it. And I'm like, well, I have great news. Let's do charcoal for a while. Mm -hmm. And people might be asking, well, then if I'm doing this and I've been on charcoal for six months, but my trichothecenes aren't, aren't dropping or my gliotoxins aren't dropping as fast as the rest of them. It's not be necessarily because the binder doesn't work. You have different pathways that detox different mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. So you might have an uncovering of some of these first. You might have more of this in storage in your cells. You might have um, a biofilm that's secreting this toxin. You might be chronically exposed. Like, And so I, I, I just try to take it from every perspective while also trying to mitigate the financial harm on people. I, I see charcoal do a great job, long story short, but I wanted people to understand where I'm coming from when I say that. That's a great explanation. And I'm a charcoal doc as well. So you're yes. preaching to the converted. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I've had like some patients where the like, modified citrus pectin or bentonite clay, like, like, oh, that's definitely worked better. And that's awesome. But yeah, mm -hmm. charcoal just seems to be a good old, you know, old reliable. So that's, I know. Yeah, great, great Imagine how boring we are, Brian. Oh my I, gosh. I know. I know. <laughs> come in, talk about charcoal. That's about it. Um, uh, I'm going to try. I want to sneak in just one other little question here before I ask yeah. you about uh, sort of just ways that folks can interact with you uh, moving forward. Um, but I, I'm just not sure which, uh, if this question applies or not. Do you do much in the way of heavy metal testing? Hmm. There was an issue that popped up a couple of years ago in Portland, mm -hmm. Oregon, or mm -hmm. just maybe just Oregon itself, where um, provocative testing for heavy metals was getting physicians in trouble. Oh. And so um, a lot of physicians might still provoke. That's great if they do. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to not. Mm -hmm. um, when I do it, I'm doing usually like a... Um, proprietary lab, some type of like, you know, um, out of pocket lab for my testing paired with insurance testing for what I can get for, um, urine and blood. And then I'm comparing it to the NHANES data mm -hmm. and going on from there. Um, with heavy metal treatments, I'll do some of the basic stuff. Uh, but if someone needs an IV in the arm chelation, um, and they need that approach, I typically direct them elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. just because I want them to have a good time. I want them to have a successful outcome. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would say I'm heavy metal literate. <laughs> I would say, um, cause you know, you can get away with a lot of oral support for mm -hmm. quite a few of these heavy metals. I mean, you can even get away with, um, rectal suppositories for chelation for some mm -hmm. of these, but, yeah. um, yeah, I would say for some of the, the bigger issues, um, I, I refer out mm -hmm. um, when it comes to big heavy metal issues. Okay. Yeah. And, and, well, maybe I'll, I'll still ask the, the question here because sure. um, uh, you know, I have some patients and it's been pretty rare, actually. I find somewhat ironically like intravenous chelation, which we do a ton of it here. Um, it's oftentimes really well tolerated. I've had patients that are like sensitive to every like oral supplement under the sun, yet IVs go just fine for I have theories as to why. But anyways, um, uh, yet I've, I've had a handful of patients. So one that I just saw last week actually, um, and like just who just cannot tolerate any form of chelator, like IV, oral. Uh, I don't think we've tried suppositories, but uh, I have used them in the past with other patients. And yeah. I'm just wondering if there are, and so like the, the issue for me is uh, just trying to find, well, what's a non-chelator option to get those metal levels down? And um, I'm just wondering if there are non-chelators, like non-DMSA, EDTA, DMPS chelators that you've seen um, historically um, to bring metal levels down in a meaningful way um, in your experience. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with the the type of metal for for sure, right? Because we do have um sorry to clear my throat. Um we do have competitive ion exchange 
with some of these things, you know, mm-hmm. like where they'll compete for our iron, they'll compete sure. for our zinc. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes supplementing those can help modify and move things. I mean, and going back to herbs like cilantro and parsley, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've, I've seen them do good things, but I've also seen horror stories where um, someone has uh, mercury fillings and they're given a cilantro product and they just like plummet. <clears throat> um, so, you know, from that perspective, I think that there, there are definitely things that you can do to whittle away at it. And then when it comes to, again, what type of heavy metal are we dealing with? Are we dealing with an organic arsenic where, you know, if they're avoiding the, um, the, the processed wood products and chicken and, and uh, public water, like, will this work out of their body sure. um, in time? Or are we doing something like mercury that's really going to have need to have some type of chelator? So, mm. um, yeah, I would say that for those sensitive folks, I also wonder what's happening with um, disturbance of the heavy metals in the biofilm that could be flaring um, a histamine dump from, you know, one of those little microbes getting out or uh, an infection flare or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, again, six degrees of separation, like what else could be happening in the body that that could be um, uh, triggering, but there's, there's so many great heavy metal training. Um, I'd be training things out there. I know Paul Anderson does a wonderful one. I know Brendan mm-hmm. Cochran. I mean, and, and you're active in this community too. You're doing, you're teaching ozone therapies and that things like that. So mm-hmm. yeah, um, I, I'd rank you up there with all of that. So um, yeah, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I would say I uh, float around in the shallow end of the pool, I'm not quite diving, diving mm-hmm. into the deep end. Sure. Um, and I wish I had more of a clear answer for you, but fine. yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thanks for the feedback anyways. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Dr. Tessier, I really appreciate your time. Um, before we part ways here, um, I'm, I just have a couple of questions uh, for you. So if someone's listening to this interview and they're thinking, you know, Dr. Tessier is brilliant. I have to work with her, um, but I'm not within reasonable driving distance. So um, <laughs> you, you mentioned about doing the educational consults. Um, and so uh, what would the process be by which someone um, could access that service? Sure. So we usually just have people um, head on to the website, which is lifeaftermold.com. Mm-hmm. And you can just fill out the contact us form there. And if you're like, hey, we want to get started, we will help you best kind of fit into what's going to best be of service for you. You don't have to find fly blindly into it. Um, but yeah, usually anyone who's going to the Life After Mold website and looking for care, um, depending on what they want, need, where they're located, we'll mm-hmm. either route them into Tessier Medical where they're seen in office, or we'll get them set up with Life After Mold for the educational consults. Okay. Great. Yeah. And I'll, I'll include that um, link in the show notes so folks can access that easily. Um, and then beyond uh, beyond that service to folks, um, do you have any online offerings or other resources um, for the public? Yeah, absolutely. So um, on my website, I do also have a uh, ebook booklet called Mold Prevention 101. Um, it walks you through your home and kind of all the hot spots that could be there. So it can either act as your, you know, your quarterly checklist to walk through your home and make sure things are, you know, in good standing order. Or if you're feeling really crummy, it could be your checklist to move through your home and see if there's any hot spots. So um, that 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 uh, that freebie, I would say, has um, served quite a few people worldwide, which I'm pretty proud about. Um, and that's for free for signing up with the newsletter. And I tell people I don't in a day, I don't, you know, self spam or anything like that. I'm usually sending out maybe at most like 10 newsletters a year. So oh, that's an exchange for hopping on the mail list. And then um, people are always welcome to find me on social media as, as you are on there. That's actually how we connected first mm-hmm. through Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course I've dragged myself onto TikTok, YouTube, you know, Facebook, <laughs> all, the, all the other platforms, but people can find me um, across most social media platforms uh, as Life After Mold. Okay, so that's your handle on uh, on all of those platforms. Yeah, okay. great. I'll put that in the show notes as well. 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I see you uh, popping up on my Instagram feed regularly. <laughs> and yeah, you seem to get interviewed pretty often. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today, Dr. Tessier. It was great. Um, we got through like this many of the questions that I had for you. <laughs> I knew we wouldn't get through them all, but even more came up as we went along. But uh, thanks so much for speaking with me, for sharing with my audience. Um, and thanks so much for all the work that you do um, you know, with ICI and, and elsewhere. It's uh, much, much appreciated. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. I've had a great time. It's wonderful interacting with a kind kindred spirit. So thank you. Kind of you to say thanks. Well, take care. Take care.